Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and Claiborne survived the bloody Battle of Chickamauga, but now the Army of Tennessee laid siege to the Union Army at Chattanooga. Again, politics would raise its ugly head within the Confederate ranks. As the Army of Tennessee entrenched themselves against the Union Army occupying Chattanooga, Braxton Bragg sent off a series of charges against those commanders he deemed disobedient. First, he suspended Heinemann for his act of disobedience at McLemore's Cove. Then, he demanded to know from Polk why he had failed to launch the dawn attack on September 20th. Polk blamed Hill, but Bragg thought it was unsatisfactory. Hill was in his crosshairs as well for being disobedient at Chickamauga. The Confederate High Command got together and wrote a petition advocating for Bragg's removal as commander of the army. It was written by Simon Bolivar Buckner and addressed to the president. Nearly everyone signed the petition except for two of Bragg's biggest detractors, Breckenridge and Cheatham. St. John Liddell also refused to sign it. Claiborne was not fond of outward expressions of his opinions. He preferred to keep his thoughts to himself, but he was convinced to sign the petition as well. Instead of helping to oust Bragg from command, it gave the president and the army commander a list of enemies. All of the troubles convinced President Davis to make a visit to the Army of Tennessee. In early October, he collectively met with Longstreet, Hill, Buckner, Cheatham, and Bragg. The four corps and division commanders agreed that Bragg was unfit for command, but the commander-in-chief wasn't convinced. The next day, Davis told Bragg he had confidence in him and to restore harmony. Bragg took this to mean that he could purge the army of those he felt was his enemies. The charges against Polk were dropped, but only if Davis agreed to send him to another command, which he did. Heinemann received a pardon. Hill was targeted by Bragg and relieved of command. Hill fought for his reputation and wanted his day in court, so he assembled testimonies and the necessary paperwork to defend himself. Bragg accused him of disobedience for not advancing into McLemore's Cove on September 10th, when the roads were obstructed to prevent Claiborne's men from reaching the cove at the desired time. Bragg even requested that Claiborne write a letter defending the decision, and the Irishman upheld Hill's decision. Hill never got his day in court because Davis insisted the decision to remove him was administrative and Bragg didn't have a case. What this did was label Claiborne as one of the anti-Bragg commanders. This left two core positions open. Bragg chose Breckenridge and Cheatham to head the two corps of the Army of Tennessee, and Longstreet commanded the divisions he brought with him from Virginia. Claiborne was able to demonstrate his ability as a field commander during the most destructive battles of the war in the Western theater, and it was these examples of bravery and ability that led President Davis to declare him the Stonewall of the West. This was a humongous compliment because he was being compared to what many Southerners considered almost a demigod on the battlefield. For unknown reasons, but possibly because of Claiborne's poor opinion of Sterling Wood's actions during the recent battle, Wood resigned his commission. Liddell would be sent back to brigade command under Claiborne. Hardy would also return to the army and take over corps command from Cheatham, who reverted back to divisional command. Bragg sent Longstreet north to Knoxville to deal with Ambrose Burnside and get Longstreet out of his hair for a time. As the Army of Tennessee perched atop Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge, Longstreet requested another division to help get rid of Burnside, and Bragg obliged, not with one division, but two. Claiborne's and Simon Bolivar Buckner's, at this point commanded by Bushrod Johnson, would be sent to Knoxville. Those two divisions marched to Chickamauga Station and began putting brigades of men on railroad cars destined for Knoxville. By mid-morning on November 23rd, Claiborne received an order from Bragg to halt putting any more troops on board. Not long after that, another message came stating to return the troops by rail to the station. Then a third order came to Claiborne, and it said the army was heavily engaged and to return to Bragg's headquarters as soon as possible. Claiborne rode ahead, leaving the division under Lucius Polk to get the division on the road to Missionary Ridge, while their division commander got clarification from Bragg's headquarters. The army commander ordered Claiborne to the right along Missionary Ridge to a place called Tunnel Hill. Polk's brigade remained along the line of retreat to guard in case a withdrawal was needed. So at the moment, he had three brigades to guard Tunnel Hill. A detached rise just north of Missionary Ridge called Billy Goat Hill needed to be secured, but when Claiborne sent his Texans, William T. Sherman's troops had already taken the heights and the Confederates were pushed back to Missionary Ridge. A mistake by Sherman's men helped Claiborne. The blue troops thought Billy Goat Hill was Missionary Ridge, or at least part of it, and had stopped. 
Claiborne didn't have his division up, and if the blue troops had pressed on, it may have spelled disaster for the southern forces. The delay allowed Claiborne to place the rest of his division. That same day, Lookout Mountain was captured, and Claiborne anticipated that Bragg would fall back, so he moved his artillery behind Missionary Ridge in preparation for withdrawal. Then he sent a courier to Bragg's headquarters to find out the commander's decision. It was after 10 p.m. when Bragg, Hardy, and Breckenridge emerged from the headquarters, and the courier found out that the Confederates were going to defend Missionary Ridge. Claiborne then had to haul the artillery back on top of the ridge in preparation for a fight the next day. The next morning, Sherman launched numerous assaults against Claiborne, heavily outnumbering the single Confederate division. At one point, Union troops took cover in a defile where Confederate artillery and musketry could not reach them. Claiborne's men resorted to rolling boulders down the ridge, which prompted the blue troops to run, and then they would be shot in the back. Sherman's men reached Claiborne's line on a few occasions, but were thrown back each time. Before the fight ended, Claiborne's men launched a counterattack that sent back the blue troops. One of Claiborne's biographers explained it well when he stated, For seven hours against odds of greater than four to one, Claiborne had used advantageous terrain, interior lines, and effective artillery fire to bolster first one threatened position, then another, repelling three separate assaults by a determined foe. As night fell, he could begin to feel confident that for this day at least, the enemy would not drive him from the ridge. However, he couldn't bask in the glory of victory for long. Although he had thrown back the Union assaults, the rest of the Confederate line had not, and a courier approached Claiborne and informed him that the center had given way. Hardy ordered Claiborne to use the three divisions still left on the ridge to hold the line until the army could withdraw. As he had been accustomed to doing, he acted as the rear guard of the army as it retreated. As the rear guard, he was tasked with protecting the wagons as well. The bridge over the South Chickamauga Creek had been burned, and Bragg wanted Claiborne to cross the creek and bivouac on the other side. Claiborne ignored the order, knowing that wading through the creek and sleeping on the cold ground might make the men sick or even kill some men. He ran the risk of being attacked with no line of retreat and bivouacked on the north side of the creek. During the night, Bragg ordered him to move to Ringgold Gap to help fight a possible Union threat. To help his men, he ordered a few men across the creek to build bonfires. Then, his men stripped out of their clothes and waded across the river and got warmed on the other side while putting on their clothes. At Ringgold Gap, Claiborne assembled his division. He placed part of his artillery in a concealed position near the gap itself. When the Federal troops arrived, they advanced within 150 yards of the gap when Claiborne ordered the brush to be drug away and the cannons fire. The canister fire ripped holes in the Union line, blunting the assault destined for their position. To the north end of Claiborne's line was the biggest concern. He had to reinforce and extend his line to meet the approaching Federals, but again, Claiborne and his division were able to throw back a force numerically superior than his own. Hardy informed Claiborne that the wagons had made it to safety and that he could withdraw. In a stage withdrawal, the division made it safely south, burning bridges to prevent the Union Army from pursuing effectively. They would go into winter camp near Dalton, Georgia.